Hey everybody and welcome to another Darkest Dungeon mod spotlight. My name is Element5 and for about the last year I've been streaming a lot of Darkest Dungeon with a heavy focus on modded content. Tonight we're taking a look at another one of my favorite modded classes, which is Marvin Seo's The Lamia. And as with the rest of Marvin Seo's modded classes, the Lamia is just fantastic. Everything from concept to sound and animation to the tuning of her abilities and utility her value as a support class, but also as an offensive class. Uh, it's just a tremendous amount of fun to play. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Marvin a little bit over the last year as he's been a regular member of my community and uh, been watching me play his classes. In fact, he put me up to something called the Seo Special Challenge, which was uh, my live stream of playing his four modded classes through the Crimson Court to kill the bosses in a single run. Uh, which was tremendously fun and uh, an exciting outcome, <laughs> to say the least. Nonetheless, I have a lot to say about my love for this class and my history of playing it over the last year and all the things we've done with it. So let's jump into how it works and where she came from. So from the class introduction, the Lamia is a deceitful creature hidden beneath a veil of beauty. The Lamia has two very distinct forms. As a human, she acts as a healer, providing much needed stress relief curing bleeds and blights and debuffing enemy targets. However, to maintain her appearance, the Lamia cannot inflict any harm. In times of desperation, the Lamia can reveal her true form, replacing her supportive abilities with attacks of unmatched versatility and effectiveness. Unfortunately, though, the hideous appearance of the Lamia can inflict massive stress to her party, and such is her nature that as she attacks, she may disrupt her own party's formation. Regardless of the form she takes, the Lamia is very fragile, relying on either her speed in beast form or her allies in human form to survive. Without the proper protection, the Lamia can easily be rendered useless or, in the worst case, dead. Now, because the Lamia is a transformation class, it means she comes out of the stagecoach uh, with all of her primary abilities unlocked and for the most part you're going to focus on these three right here Which are her support kit, okay? Because so the veil is her transformation ability once you hit the veil and she pops snake as we call it or goes offensive She will change forms and then you'll be utilizing her aggressive abilities on this side So for now we're going to focus just on her support kit and how that works And then we'll talk about what it's like to go snake and when to utilize her offensive abilities and how those work so playing with the Lamia, I think it's important to think about her fragility. She doesn't actually have a lot of hit points or pro or any prot. She has a decent level of speed. Uh, speed determines helps to determine uh, which characters will act first at the beginning of a round. Uh, your speed number plus a die roll eight calculates which will go first. So her having a little bit more speed is beneficial to getting that heal off or to getting her into a position uh, where she's a little bit less vulnerable and of course using her beast form will also buff her dodge and her speed uh, in order to help her be a little bit more survivable and as a standalone healer if used appropriately she can be an absolutely adequate support class now starting off we're just gonna let's take a look at her heal which is cleansing tide now at rank 5 cleansing tide does a direct heal of 6 to 8 plus a guaranteed cure of bleed or blight uh, now if we just compare that to exam for example to divine grace so the level 5 ability of a legendary vestal uh, a direct heal of 8 to 9 is not too much higher than the direct heal of 6 to 8 so those are at least comparable but it's important to note that the cure um, has a huge huge implication of utility and survivability to it because uh, if you think about the amount of damage taken from a very, very serious bleed from, say, one of the Krabbies in the Cove on the champion level or a massive blight, to just completely remove and mitigate that damage makes her that much more of a powerful healer. To complement this, you can certainly give her trinkets like the Ancestor's Scroll or her own uh, unique Caregiver's Ring, which buff her healing abilities and stress healing abilities, even at the cost of making her a little bit more fragile. Um, of course, you could use Junia's head as well, but anything to buff her healing ability is going to make this just perform much better. Next in her support kit is Arietta. 
Now this is essentially her stress heal, and it is also limited to being in position uh, 3 or 4. Now what's fun about this stress heal is that it stress heals herself and another target at the same time uh, with a chance to clear horror. So at level 5, it is stress minus 6 to herself and another party member, plus a 20% stress heal received buff with a 66% chance to clear horror. Uh, this is a very decent stress heal, and again, you can improve this by using things like the Ancestor Scroll or her Caregiver's Ring, etc. Um, but but the important thing to take, in, to take into consideration here is that if you go Beast Form, you're going to be applying Ticks of Horror to the rest of the members of your party. So to be able to come out of Beast Form and then quickly start singing that horror off is actually quite useful. So then the last ability in her support kit is Allure. This is her crowd control. Uh, this is a pull one position. She can use it, again, limited to position three or four, but it can hit an enemy in any rank. It will pull it forward with 100%, 140% chance to pull forward one. It will bypass guard. It has a chance to land a debuff for minus 20 dodge and crits received chance plus 8%. So actually rather powerful when you can when you consider the application of this ability. If for example, you have a backline stressor or damage dealer that you would like to reach, this is where some of her utility comes in. Just pull that forward. Even better, if it gets guarded say by a pelagic guardian, you can just break that guard and lure this sucker forward. I'd like to think about this um thematically as if she's literally so beautiful, she's just luring the enemy target out of its protective space. So now the fun begins. So essentially, if for any reason you should be in a tight spot or you need to deliver a crucial hit before one comes your way, it's time to pop Snake. It's time to use the Veil. The Veil is her transformation ability. Uh, as human, change to mode Beast, gain 20 dodge and 5 speed, but apply to other heroes a horror for 3 stress over the next 4 rounds. Uh, this is where the fun happens, and this is where uh, this character really stands out. This is what makes her a lot like a support version of of an abomination. She will absolutely stress out the rest of your party, uh, but she will save you in a pinch. Festering fear consumes the mind. Now, once you've decided to drop the facade and pop snake and reveal herself as the creature she is, you now have access to her offensive abilities. And the first in line is Petrifying Gaze. Now, Petrifying Gaze is her stun, you can use it from any position. It will target all three of the first enemies. Uh, and you can only use it three times per battle. It's a ranged ability that has a 130% chance to stun, as well as land a minus 25% dodge debuff and a minus five speed debuff, which will also shuffle her in position. And it's important to note that when she goes snake, she's a little bit more survivable in terms of gaining more speed and more dodge, but she's also a lot more mobile. So she's going to be sort of jumping around and shuffling around your team, and it's important to think about bringing a team that can handle that sort of shuffle if you plan on using the snake utility. As the fiend falls, a faint hope blossoms. So next in her offensive kit is Slither. Now Slither can be used in position two, three, or four. You can target any enemy in any position, including the farthest back line in rank four. It's going to shoot you forward to the front line. It's forward three. So you're gonna go from position four all the way to the front line. And then you're gonna buff yourself for 20 dodge, which helps you be even more survivable at that front line. But this is the important piece here. It's doing 75% damage versus blighted and stunt. So this is sort of her bread and butter attack. You're going to commit to dropping the veil, going snake, being aggressive and landing a blow. And if you can preface that, if you can set that up by first landing a stun on an enemy or landing a blight on an enemy, you're gonna hit it super hard. 
and uh, that is a really efficient way to sort of capitalize on her damage, gain the advantage in battle, and then bring her back, calm her down. Well struck. So therefore, the last ability in her offensive kit is Hiss. Uh, Hiss can only be used in position one, two, or three, and it will target both enemies in position one or two. Now, this is going to launch you all the way back. So this is part of the shuffle dance that she has. You're jumping forward with Slither. You're shuffling around with Petrifying Gaze, or you're going all the way to the back line with Hiss. And the important thing to understand about Hiss is this is her blight attack. This is where she sprays venom, essentially, from her glands all over the frontline enemies. It's a 140% chance to blight for six over three at level five and debuff targets for minus 20% prot. Impressive. Now, once you've used Hiss and you've kind of gotten her back into position four, a position that you feel like she's ready to be to to calm back down, to reapply her veil, her facade, uh, go back to human form and go back into being more of a support role, you just use the veil again, de-stress the group. She'll transform back to human. She'll lose some dodge. She'll lose some speed, but she'll de-stress her all the other heroes a little bit and calm things down. And that's where you can start to then go back to healing or using Arietta and taking the stress down from the heroes that she just recently freaked out. Now, the fun doesn't stop there. She also has a really interesting camping kit, and uh, it starts with Stock Prey. Now, Stock Prey is a time cost three, self-only buff for minus 10% chance that your party is surprised for the next four battles, and a 30% chance that monsters are surprised for the next four battles. So if you understand the power of scouting in Darkest Dungeon, even after the Color of Madness nerfs, you know that uh, so being surprised and party surprise is a big part of that. You know, surprising your enemy is, is the event in which you come into a room, the enemies spawn, and they all have sort of the exclamation over their heads. That means your entire team is going to be first to act before they do. That's obviously much better than the opposite. So having this buff is... Uh, Having this camping skill is actually a decent utility. So next in her camping kit is probably my favorite of her camping abilities, which is Soothing Presence. A time cost four, all companions reduce by 10 stress, but also get a minus 20% stress taken buff. Important to note that this says all companions, so she doesn't actually get this buff or de-stress, but just her companions. Now this is really obviously uh, useful if you're going to be heading into a certain boss fight or a dungeon where stress is relatively high, especially in the champion levels, or you're going to something like the Necromancer or maybe the Siren, something that throws out a lot of stress at your group, um, be dealing with ghouls, etc. Having that stress buff is pretty significant, and it's a nice way to just sort of camp and cool things down, etc. But the, uh, the brilliance of this camping skill is that the application really sets her up to be able to go snake more often, obviously, because if you're going to be applying stress and horror to the rest of your party by going snake, uh, well, then why wouldn't you do that uh, after debuffing the damage, the stress damage that that's going to do? So really love this ability. Uh, definitely utilize it for a lot of things like sh uh, snake dreams with the shield breaker. Uh, anytime that I feel like I want to play her aggressively, do not underestimate it. So the next ability is Lamprey's Kiss. Now, Lamprey's Kiss is essentially just her remove disease. It also comes with remove blight. Uh, it's only a time cost too, so it's very cheap. But it's also got the added cost of 15 stress to whomever you're using it on. It's important to note that she doesn't use it on herself. And uh, as I mentioned previously, she actually has uh, a high vulnerability to disease. She's very, she has very low disease resistance, a very high blight resistance. Um, so it, again, typically think about the Plague Doctor being the only class with a camp skill, or one of the only classes with a camp skill, where you can just remove a disease from somebody. Otherwise, you've got to pay a decent amount of money in a sanitarium to do that uh, and sit out a week. So this has got great utility. It's really affordable and uh, definitely a nice take along. So last in her camping kit is Immodest Vanity. Only a time cost one. This is how she will cool herself down. This is self only, minus 30 stress but at the cost of five stress to all her companions in the party and a coin flip on another five stress to each companion in the party. So um, again, 
a fantastic kit, really. A, no prevent ambush, which is fine. A lot of utility, though. Tons of stress healing and stress prevention, uh, including the ability to get a little bit of incentive and advantage in combat with chance monster surprised. And then, of course, if things go a little bit crazy, you're in the Warrens, you take on a couple diseases, you've got Lamprey's Kiss, uh, which will help out significantly. And if she, for some reason, should become the focus of a ton of stress and gets a little overheated, you can cool her down as well. Now, in terms of bringing her with different group compositions, I tend to think about what her utility will complement the most. So do I have a stress healer? Yes or no. Do I need a cure? Am I heading into the cove at the champion level or the veteran level? Am I going to a place where diseases are going to be? Am I heading into a boss fight like the Necromancer or something where, you know, a primary utility of that boss is going to be dropping a lot of stress on my group? If the answer is yes, then she has a lot of application and uh, will definitely help you out. I think typically I like to use her aggressively uh, with her Blight in consideration to those dungeons that are more vulnerable to Blight damage, again, the Ruins or the Cove. Uh, but in all, she's a really fantastic support no matter what dungeon you take her in. She performed very, very well in the uh, Crimson Court runs that we did for the Seo Special. And I encourage you to really have fun with her. Think about building aggressive groups with her if you want to take her as a primary offensive build and use her snake all the time. You can absolutely take a secondary stress healer along with you in the group if you wanted to help mitigate that stress damage. But again, just realize that a lot of what's in her kit thematically, mechanically, uh, well executed and set up very, very well. So again, using Soothing Presence to just soften the blow of when she drops the veil and pops snake, uh, using Arietta to calm things down after she does, you, realizing the the power of having a decently sized heal, which can be buffed with trinkets, uh, decent stress heal, which can be buffed with trinkets, and the added utility of a cure. Uh, just an all around really, really sound modded class. And of course, it's worth noting that Marvin also took care to make a an immediate town event mod, which you can download if you would like to play her immediately rather than wait for her to show up in the stagecoach. You install that mod and then in the following week you'll get a town event which allows you to just take in a free Lamia and try her out. There is also, of course, the Crimson Court Trinkets mod that you can download for her, uh, the newest Color of Madness Trinkets, and if you're looking to have the District, which will improve her abilities in some of Marvin's other classes, you can also download the Amphitheater mod. Of course, all of these will be linked in the information below the video. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask in the comments section below. I sincerely hope that this brief overview of one of my favorite modded classes, the Lamia, has been helpful. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, we'll see you next time.